Tiki Hut Media. Pop the top on your favorite beer or whatever you drink from Tiki Hut Media. This is Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. He's dumb as dirt, bless his heart. Hey there, got my beer in my hand. Coming to you from Tiki Hut Media Studios in Tennessee. I'm Jerry Wicker. This is Soul Rambling. So glad you could join us today. Thank you for being here. And in this episode, we're looking at a topic that I think a lot of people care about, but we all sort of struggle with. And it's something I personally struggle with. And if we're honest, I think all of us to a certain degree struggle with this. It's this idea that we should stop caring what other people think. Now, in theory, that's a really good idea, right? Like, we shouldn't spend all of our time worrying about everybody else and what they think about us, and we shouldn't filter ourselves based on what other people might think about us. It's just not a good way to go about life. It's going to lead to a place where we're making decisions for other people instead of making decisions for ourselves. We're going to get to a place where we are shockingly unhappy with the life that we've built because that life was never built for us in the first place. It was built for everyone else, their expectations, and that's just not really a good place to find ourselves. And the reason I say I struggle with this is I am what I call a recovering people pleaser. I really do care. I, I'm, I'm not as much as I used to. I'm still struggling with this. As Paul said, I've, I've not yet arrived. I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm better than I used to be. It's something where we've got to shut out the voices of everyone else sometimes. We've got to shut out the words that everyone else has to say and the judgment that everyone else has to add to our lives and, and just focus on what do we want to be doing? What is it we want to create? If we can find that answer, then we can build a life that makes us happy and makes us content without any of the other nonsense pieces, right? So that's what we need to tackle today, is how we can stop caring about what other people think so that we can start to make those decisions that are going to ultimately make us happier and ultimately help us create the life that we actually want, not the life that we're sort of being pushed towards. So how are we going to tackle this? Well, got three tips here, and these tips come from two different articles. I'll have links to these articles in the show notes of this episode. The first is called, What I Learned When I Stopped Caring About What Other People Thought of Me. And the second is titled, Eight Ways to Stop Worrying About What Other People Think. Now, the first article is published on Medium in the Personal Growth section, and the second is from Psychology Today. Now, before we jump into it, I want to share from that first article in the Medium article uh, a quick little section of what she says she sort of learned after she stopped caring, right? So what she walked away with, the realization she had after she got to that place where she stopped caring. So this is a section quote. This is the most obvious benefit, she says. Life is better when you're not so concerned about how other people will view you for your actions, choices, and decisions. There's great freedom from doing what makes you happy, being authentically yourself. Whether this is something as simple as how you dress, the career path you choose, or anything else, when you're true to yourself and don't allow the assumed thoughts of others to dictate your choices, life possibilities expand and your joy increases. So for this particular person, she found that when she stopped caring about what other people thought, and she made choices based on what she actually wanted, what mattered to her, she was far, far happier. She felt far more freedom. She felt like she could actually be the person she was. And that is something I think most of us truly want. But we don't know how to get there. When you ask most people, what's your biggest goal? Oh, I want to be free, they say. Well, what's holding you back? What are your chains? What is the thing that's stopping you from having that freedom? It's always going to be the judgment of other people. You think that if you don't make choices in this particular way, or you don't dress this particular way, or you don't think this particular way, then everybody around you is going to point to you and laugh, and they're going to judge you silently, and they're going to think of you as a bad person. But in truth, and in fact, They don't care. This is a newsflash. They really don't care. And we're going to talk about that 
here in just a second because it's one of my biggest points on this. But you have to be you. You have to own who you are. And you might not know who that is yet. But the reason you don't know who that is is because you've lived your entire life based on everyone else's opinion. I know. I've been there. You don't know who you are because you've never been forced to think about who you are. You've never been forced to ask yourself that question. And until you do, until you start finding those answers, and it's going to take a lot of experimentation, it's going to take a lot of work, there's going to be a lot of frustration. But until you know who you are, and you make choices based on that rather than on what someone else thinks or everyone else thinks or wants, you're never going to feel free. Money won't lead to freedom. Passion won't lead to freedom. Being yourself is what will lead to freedom. So let's get to the first the first way of solving this. The first thing we need to do is recognize, and this comes from that same author of the Medium article. Her name is Nia Shanks. And here's the first thing, is that the negative comments someone makes is always about them and not you. So you've, you've probably heard this before, right? So people, when you're a kid, right, they're bullying. They say they have this, like, great quote that hurt people, hurt people, people bullied, people lash out, people make negative comments because they themselves are hurting, because they themselves don't feel like enough, because they themselves feel like they are going through something. And so their way of dealing with that is to lash out. And this is a learned behavior. This is something that you learn if you're raised that way. If that's the relationship you have with your family, if that's a relationship you have with your friends, hurt people, hurt people, the negative comments someone makes about you. And if if somebody makes a negative comment on the way you're dressing or the way you think or the job you want or the thing you're so incredibly excited about, someone makes a negative comment about that, it's because they are empty and they are hurt. They are the ones who are struggling. And it could be as simple as, They wish they were doing something they loved, and so they feel like, well, if I can't, no one else should. But whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. You have to recognize that when someone makes a negative comment, it's not on you. That is not about you, and it's not your job to fix it. It's not your fault that they don't like that shirt you wore, and that's not on you. If you love that shirt, wear the damn shirt. Now, a caveat here, a couple of weeks ago, We talked about a book I read. It's called Toxic Positivity. And one of the things the author of that book talks about is that very phrase, hurt people, hurt people. If this now this applies to when we're trying to people, please, and realize that these comments that people make and realize that that's coming from their hurt, not hurt. They're trying to hurt you because they are hurt. That does not justify somebody hurting you. Okay, we're not victim blaming here. We're not glossing over it and saying it's okay for people to hurt you. So I want that to be kept perfectly clear. So there is a a, we have to balance that out and realize that when we say hurt people, hurt people, we realize then what the motivation for them hurting us was. But that does not negate the hurt that they caused us. Okay, back to my point. We got to realize that the negative comments someone makes is about them. And you'll get to a place where you start ignoring the negative comments where it doesn't hit you as much. And that is not easy. Like that's still going to take work. But the first step is realizing that it's not about you. And the way you can do this is in a very practical way is that when it happens, you're still going to feel it, right? You're still going to feel that pain. You're still going to be hurting. You're still going to emotionally have that reaction to wanting to defend yourself and wanting to prove that it's fine and wanting to change it somehow. But then you need to stop and you need to go into your head and you need to repeat over and over and over again. It's not about me. It's on them. It's not about me. It's on them. It's not about me. It's on them. Repeat that until you believe it. And again, sometimes you have to set up a boundary. And sometimes that negative person, that toxic person, might be time to reconsider having them as part of your life, part of your circle. And you're not going to believe it at first when you keep repeating it, but eventually you do that enough. And guess what? Eventually in that context, you start to gain that belief and you start to have that response naturally. 
So that's the first step. Realize that the negative comments someone makes is about them and not you. And here's the second thing to keep things in perspective. And this one comes from the article on Psychology Today. It's titled, Eight Ways to Stop Worrying About What Other People Think. So I'm going to quote the, his section here and then going to expand on it. It said that people would care a lot less about what others think about them if they knew how little others think about them. And it's true. Everyone has enough to occupy their mind. They also have their own insecurities. If you're worried about how you come across to someone you've just met, keep in mind that they're probably doing the same. Now, you probably know this, right? This isn't anything groundbreaking. Like, I'm not discovering a new particle or something like this. Is This is pretty common knowledge, and it's very, very true. People are not thinking about you. People are not thinking about me like they don't really care. <laughs> In fact, the fact that we think people are thinking about us is quite honestly a sign that we're maybe a bit cocky, maybe a bit narcissistic. <laughs> like, why would somebody be thinking about me? And that, for some people, might be sad, but it's also true, and it's really relieving because it means that the people around you, the people that you're sitting next to on the bus or the people that are in the cars next to you, they really, truly do not care about you and what you're wearing or what job you have or what you're doing. They really don't. And they're not sitting there judging you. If you currently work at a coffee shop, the person that's ordering from you isn't sitting there silently judging you. They might have a thought, but as soon as they walk out the door, they're not thinking about you again. If no one cares what I'm doing, then guess what? I can do whatever I want. I can live the life I want to live because why would I live a life based on what everyone else wants if no one really actually cares all that much? So keep it in perspective. And then last, the last piece of advice I have on how to stop caring about what other people think is to question your thinking. Now, again, this comes from the Psychology Today article, and it's titled Eight Ways to Stop Worrying About What Other People Think. Highly recommend you read it. But the last thing is to question your thinking. What do we mean when we say this? Well, I'm going to quote again from his section and then expand on it a little bit. He says, humans tend toward cognitive distortions, patterns of negative thinking that can hurt our mood or behavior. For example, we may assume the worst or filter out the good in a situation and pay attention only to the bad. Or we may overgeneralize or jump to conclusions. Pay attention to your thoughts and question them rather than allowing impressions to run away with you. You may discover that what you're fretting over exists only in your mind. So there's this term called catastrophizing, which is this phenomenon where we humans tend to take things that happen and push it to the most negative conclusion and then take that negative conclusion and push it to its most negative outcome. And it's this really interesting thing that we do that I think a lot of people do. This is why we sort of spiral out of control and things seem to get bigger than they actually are. Here's an example. You interview for a job and you just immediately assume, oh, I didn't get it. But then you also assume from the I didn't get it, which, by the way, was made up. You assume then, oh, no, no one will ever hire me. I'm going to end up on the street and homeless and my family will be embarrassed by me and so on and so forth, right? Eventually, you get to the place where you truly believe that you are a drain on society and all because of an interview you sat for that you even you haven't even heard back from yet. So this is a real thing. We all do it in different contexts. But we really need to question that thinking because this is a big part of why we sort of force ourselves to do what other people want instead of doing what we want as well. This is all in our head. We're all stressed and worried about what everyone thinks, and very few people are actually expressing what they think to us because, again, no one actually cares about us all that much. So what do we do? Well, we need to recognize, first of all, that this is in our head that the look somebody gave us when we were driving in our car probably had nothing to do with the shirt we were wearing. Probably not related, honestly. Like, they were probably just frustrated with something else, or maybe they weren't even looking at you. We need to recognize that 
when we walk into our job and our coworker doesn't smile at us, it doesn't have anything to do with us. It's not because uh, of the shirt we're wearing. It's not because we're a bad worker. They could just be having a bad day. Maybe they had uh, put their pet down that morning. We don't know. And because we don't know, we can't go to all these places that we make up in our heads. So we need to check our thinking. We need to put that shit out the door. We need to put it at the door and ask ourselves, what is the reality here? What actually happened here versus what's going on in my head? And listen, I know this is not easy. Being frustrated and ashamed by other people's thoughts of us is an emotional reaction. And I'm telling you to solve it with a logical fake. I get that this isn't something you fix overnight. You fix it over time. You keep working on it and you keep trying to catch yourself and you forgive yourself when you screw up and eventually you get there. So that's my big three pieces of advice. These things have helped me. I'm definitely not there yet, but they have helped me. And I need you to hear this. Your life isn't yours if you always care what other people think. If you're a people pleaser. You don't control your life if you are living in constant worry or concern of how others will perceive you, and it controls your life. But it goes much deeper than this. So here are some signs that you are living life for others, that you actually care too much about what people think. The first one is you're living in the past. If you find yourself holding on to grudges, replaying things people said about you, good and bad, you're not living life on your own terms. The only opinion that matters is yours and what you feel about yourself. But if you're living in the past, it's impossible to live life on your terms. A second sign you're living life for others is spending money to boost people's perception of you. Especially during the holidays, if you feel pressure to spend money on gifts or because your coworker got you a gift and now you feel obliged, you're living life for others. Here's what I know for certain people, including your kids, don't care as much as you think they do. You can get a $500 gift or a $5 gift card or write a thoughtful thank you card, and they equally carry the same meaning. The only person putting meaning on the gift is you. You don't need to spend to prove your worth. And the third thing is allowing societal standards to become your norm. You don't have to get married after dating for five years. You don't have to have kids as a way of checking the next box in life. You don't need to go to college necessarily. You especially don't need to work a job you hate because it pays well. These are all choices. There's a lot of incredible ways to live life on your own terms. But do it on your own terms. If you feel pressure from society on how you should do things, take a step back and ask, do I really want those things? Or am I feeling pressure from my friends, family, my significant other, or strangers? There's a huge difference between caring what people think and allowing what people think to control your life. It's normal to care what people think of you. It's not healthy when you care so much it dictates your decision. We'll be right back after this short break. Some moms travel miles for a present. The Cash's mom traveled the country for her child's life. To St. Jude. Yep. Cash was diagnosed in California with a rare cancer. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital tailored a special treatment just for him. Our research helps save kids everywhere. Want to do lunch? Well, someone is feeling a lot better. Go to stjude.org or shop wherever you see the St. Jude logo. She's a real bad love for me. Only in my phone once a week got me losing who I used to be. But I don't know why she moves me for me once. That's called She Moves Me by Jarris Johnson. That's from the Spotify playlist, the Soul Ramblings podcast playlist over on Spotify. Link is in the show notes. You can find some great music over there. I invite you to go over and check out our playlist on Spotify. Soul Ramblings podcast is where each week we talk about faith and life over a cold beer or three or four or whatever you drink. I'll have a Jack and Coke, please. Sure, Jack and Coke will work if that's what you I want. I brought white Zinfandel. <gasps> Jesus drank wine. Well, that's true. Wine will work. But I prefer a cold beer. Bet I can funnel a beer faster than you. You probably could. No argument there.
And today, we reach a turning point in the gospel according to Mark. We're actually looking at Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through chapter 9, verse 9. Pretty long passage there, so you can read that on your own. I won't take up time and read that entire passage today. But suffice it to say, up until now, up until this point in this scripture passage, Jesus has been ministering in the northeastern part of Israel. He's been healing and teaching, stilling storms, feeding thousands, confronting authorities, and raising up disciples. All the while, people have been asking, who is he? For the first half of the Gospel of Mark, the identity of Jesus has been obscured, even intentionally, and now he is ready to talk about it. Before they go up the mountain, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? But what he's really interested in is who the disciples say he is. Peter, of course, is the one to speak up. You are the Christ, he says. Peter is right, and also not right. The word Christ means Messiah, and it indicates Jesus as God's anointed one, the one in whom God's power and purposes will be made known. So far, so good. But like most Jews, Peter must have had some clear expectations for God's Messiah, specifically He would have imagined the Christ to be strong and powerful in the traditional ways. The Messiah was meant to provide leadership and protection to God's people to restore the kingdom of David. So when Jesus goes on to say that the Messiah must suffer and be rejected and be killed and finally rise, Peter doesn't just object. He takes hold of Jesus, scolds him, begins to correct him. He's objecting intellectually to the idea that God's Messiah would suffer and die. He's not objecting emotionally to the thought of this agony for his friend, but Jesus does not back down. In fact, he corrects Peter about as sternly as anyone could. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says. He'll spend the second half of Mark's gospel redefining Messiah for Peter and the other disciples, and ultimately all the world and us. But first, the mountaintop. Jesus leads Peter, James, and John up the mountain. There, Jesus is transformed so that his glory shines through. His clothes become dazzling bright. And he is seen to speak with two of Israel's heroes, Moses and Elijah. Peter, James, and John saw Moses and Elijah with Jesus. Moses and Elijah were widely associated with the end times. So their presence plus the voice from heaven, this is my son whom I love, listen to him, should have made it clear to the disciples that Jesus was not to be doubted, let alone scolded. His word was like God's word. They were meant to believe it. In each of the Gospels, Peter sees all of this and says, it's good that we're here. He suggests they build some booths or shrines on the mountain, one for each prophet, I don't know what motivated Peter or what he had in mind when he suggested building shrines. As Mark tells it, Peter hardly knew himself. Like the other disciples, Peter was terrified and didn't know how to respond to the transfigured Jesus. I personally find his shrine suggestion appealing. As a matter of fact, I have little shrines all throughout my home. Beth and I both do. And I feel good when I look at those things. I feel inspired, peaceful, determined. It provides a mini mountaintop experience right there in my home. But Peter's suggestion is often interpreted as a desire to stay up there on the mountain. He's seen as wanting to build a place to live where where it's safe and shiny and reassuring. Don't we all want to stay in places where we feel good? Peter's impulse to build shrines up there on the mountain may reflect his resistance to engaging the hard stuff below. Over and over in Mark's gospel, it's made clear that Jesus is both the Son of God, powerful agent of healing, and subject of dazzling glory, and also the human one, who will be betrayed and persecuted and crucified. Like many Christians throughout the church's life, Peter and the disciples wanted the glory they could see without the message they had to hear. And who could blame them? Who could blame the disciples for not wanting to believe Jesus must suffer? Why Jesus must suffer is a natural question to ask, and the answer is by no means clear. I mean, Jesus could have stayed on the mountain, but he chose to come down. 
think about a valley in your life, your low point, your challenging path. And remember, nothing in life or in death can separate us from Christ, and his company can make all the difference. The Apostle Paul imagines it, kind of, in a passage from 2 Corinthians. He says, God has shown into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in clay pots. So it's clear that the awesome power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. But we can wrap ourselves up in it. And when we do, he says, we may experience all kinds of trouble, but we won't be crushed. We may be confused, but we won't be depressed. We may be harassed, but we won't be abandoned. We may be knocked down, but we won't be knocked out. Even if our bodies are wasting away, Paul says, deep within, we are being renewed. Deep within, we are growing more glorious. Deep within, we are being held safe and transfigured by God. Even in the valley, the presence of Christ and his power are available to give God's people the courage and strength to do what we need to do, which is to follow him. Peter learned the hard way, as all humans do. Peter learned it by following Jesus down the mountain into places full of suffering and despair. Even there, he kept seeing Christ's glory shine upon all kinds of people in the middle of various highs and lows. And Peter learned to thank God for a Messiah like that, a Christ who comes down. Glory to God. Amen. Be sure to connect with us on social media, whether on Facebook, Instagram, Substack, or you can email us. All of those links are in the show notes of this episode. And wherever you're listening today, would you please click subscribe so you never miss a new episode. Thank you so much for the gift and privilege of your time today. And a programming note, we will not have an episode next week. We will be back in two weeks as we start Lent with Ash Wednesday. So be sure to join us then. And I leave you with my favorite Bible verse, Philippians 4, 8. Today from the Common English Bible, from now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Thank you for being here. I'm Jerry Wicker. He's a goober. (laughs) Grace. Peace. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Soul Ramblings with Jerry Wicker. Download new episodes every week. And if you haven't already, subscribe and be sure to leave us a rating and review. Soul Ramblings is a Tiki Hut Media production.